Welcome to this week's episode of The Nero Show. In today's episode, new bikes from Pinarello, Bianchi and Ridley. What do we think? The biggest bike flops of 2023 so far. We run through our list. The road world champion decides to ride mountain bikes at the Olympics. And Lance is ripping it up climbs in Majorca. Should we be doing something similar? All right, let's get into it. All right, I feel like it's been a while since we, we had a good old chat about bikes, yep. Jesse. Yep. So let's change that this week because there, there's, a, there's a few bikes that have popped out this week that are worth discussing. I want to start with the Dogma X. Yep. Now, a couple of weeks ago when we did last talk about bikes, we were mostly talking about endurance bikes, and I think we'd both agree we're singing the praises of what Giant were doing with the Defy. Yep. This, okay, so this is a challenging one for me. Uh, if do, does anyone come to the Nero show for specs? I don't know if I actually do. Uh, look, the, the Dogma X is a new endurance bike, um, essentially uh, shorter reach, slacker geometry, endurancey look and feel to, to that kind of thing. So tick. Mm-hmm. Where it kind of gets confusing for me is everywhere else. Now we're keeping. A, there's a lot of. There are a lot of specs available to this. So much so, it's very, very confusing. Yeah. So you have They've this bungled the specs up on it. The the, the, the different types and and X nines and Xs, and then the previous model still seems like they're doing it with the different seat stay things. It's a whole basket case, really. So just just on that, so the X nine, which is the sort of top of the line thing, has the this exciting new piece of geometry uh, or frame design going on at the back end. This lattice structure. But in the same line, but well, maybe it's not the same line, is the X. So we go down to the X4, 5. No, it still has it, the X3. So when you get to the X3, you now don't have the lattice anymore. That's, that's just disappeared. Yeah, you're we, dreaming. You're once, not getting the lattice at a three level. There's no, no sculpture at the three level. All right, but um, as far as anything else, does it, okay, I'll hand this to you. Anything here that's particularly noteworthy? I don't know why you're getting up in arms about this one, Chris, to be honest. I think this is a classic what what we gave Giant credit for with the Defy. I think they've done it here. So it's the Dogma F or the Dog, whatever the hell the road bike's called. It's taller geometry, a bit slacker. It's the top level of carbon, the million grade, which is what people want. And wider tyre clearance, 35 mil tyres. And Bob's your uncle. What's what's not to like here? I'm thinking this is ticking all the boxes. Nothing too gimmicky. I mean, I think that seat tube, seat stay junction, I think is a work of art. I mean, that looks uh. that looks cool. That's to me, that's not in the gimmick bucket, like a suspension thing. That's in the looks. No, that's looks even nice. worse than a suspension thing for me. This this is the the we're we're attempting to solve a problem that doesn't really exist here. So we are yeah. I mean. What I was giving the Defy credit for was just the simplicity of okay, we're going to spec up, we're going to spec up a frame with with only geometry differences to the to the Propel and really target someone who's considering buying the Propel and say no, no, you don't need that. Here's what you actually need, and you know what? It pretty much looks exactly the same. This doesn't. This has this bizarre like. Milan sculpture thing on the, the back stays. of it. The X stays. What's wrong with the X stays? Now, I, I think they look cool. Pinarello, see, but Pinarello, this is the problem. They've got a history with this shit. So they went and did the, remember the suspension or they put like a bloody. Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. They we're, rolled that thing at Paris Bay <laughs> yeah. a few years ago. Everyone's like, no. So we're all, I don't know why we're obsessed with just whatever's going on in that part of the bike. We don't need this anymore. I was. That's why I was so impressed with the Defy. I was like, okay, we've finally got over this. The endurance bike's back because all the all the really good endurance bikes in history, and I think of things like the the CAD, didn't need the gimmicks. And I just kind of feel like this has gone back a step by throwing in the X days. Mm, I I don't know what to say. I mean, who's to say that's not more compliant? I mean, looking at it compared to the the road version, the Dogma, um, it's thinner. Probably a bit lighter. Mm. I don't know. I just can't see. I can't see a dogma buyer or a Pinarello purchaser 
choosing this over the oh, over the other really? one. Really? I yeah. saw this on – this was popped up on my Instagram a couple of times and it catches the eye, the X stays. I think this is – I think this is good because I'm also a fan of that LaPierre, which has the seat tube disconnected from the seat stays. Um, so I like that sort of thing. So I think this is cool. I think this is a good cross between not just being boring, wider tire clearance version of the road bike and also not being a gimmick but having a good mix. So I th- I'm a fan of this. It's just the price of the top model. Well, that's yeah, that's like, sort of the other the other one because I, I do I do want to almost give them credit for the big range, the most confusing, ridiculous range. Don't get me wrong, but there, at least there is a big range that runs all the way down to a five thousand dollar or five thousand euro set. So that's that's a thing, but to essentially be charging the same as your top end race bike for the top end version of this, I don't know. It do, it, I mean, look at that photo. Dogma X Tura Ace Di2 with the wavy Princeton Carbon Works wheels. I mean, and the, the latest X says with that in a shop. I'm picking that over the the Dogma S. That just looks that looks sick. I just yeah, I mean, the price is crazy, but we can we can all get over that now. I think the I don't, I, don't, I think they've done what the giant defy did, but it looks a bit cooler. I'm for it. I, I'm on board. We agree to disagree on this one. Okay. Anything else? What else have you spotted recently? Well, uh, so in the cast, well, of the other recent releases, one I'm going to say, flop, put in the flop category, is the new Ridley, the Ridley Falcon Falcon, <laughs> Falcon RS. So the, the takeout of Val makes it sound cooler. So. It's sort of four years too late. It's just the your classic all around the aero and lights, bit of wider tire clearance. I mean, SL7 did this. It's an NBB lap. Is it? Isn't it an NBB lap? Pretty cute thing. Well, yeah. It, nah, oh, dude, I'm getting more. This looks like a Van Rizzle. Oh, this is full Van Rizzle. <laughs> uh, I mean, Ah, I mean, what's the small? Why would anyone? I hate saying why would anyone buy this? Because it's so expensive to be able to own it. But really, but just you're getting the Noah. You'd have to say. I mean, but they say this. But then they come with the market and say it's as fast as the Noah, and you go, oh, okay, fair enough. Oh, it seems so boring. It's a very boring bike. Uh, I'm not going to disagree with you. Ridley's a funny like. This is like this the slowest decline brand. I think out there, uh, there was a moment like I've written, we were the first year on the team, we had Ridley's and, mm-hmm. and at that moment, I reckon they were pretty cool bikes. They were, yeah. this is, yeah, I don't know what's, what's sort of gone on here. I did notice, and you pointed this out to me, that they are still claiming that some of this stuff's made in Belgium. Made in Belgium. You cl- So you click through, you type in Ridley's Fal- Falcon, mm. top link on Google, Go through the specs, scroll to the bottom of the page. Made in Belgium, tick. There is, whoa. <laughs> what does that definition mean? There's absolutely no way by anyone's definition of made that this is made in Belgium. Things made in Taiwan. I don't understand why, how they can legally still put that in there. Um, this brand, I reckon, so this has a really bad, distribution history especially in Australia. I've heard this I think Dave Arthur mentioned this in his video talking about the way it was handled in the UK and it's kind of similar here because I know Bike Bug had it like in the uh, sort of 2010s and had it and it was kind of a premium brand and then they slashed the prices on it like full close out sale because they were losing the brand and probably hurt the brand because you could log onto a Bike Bug and get like a $1,000 sort of Noah fast frame for like almost a year. Then I think FE Sports took it over and probably didn't they didn't really have an idea of what they were doing initially. And it really suffered throughout those years. And I would say certainly in this country, it hasn't really come back from that. Mm. Like so many brands have gone into that space. Like I've I mentioned the the melee, but yeah, like even a Van Rizzle can kind of compete with this. Yeah. 
I mean, at least the other ones had an identity, but Noah Fast has an identity. Caleb rides it. You've got the classics guys riding it. I get it. This new one, I just, where does it sit? I haven't seen any pros riding it. It's doing something that other bikes sold on four years ago. Bit of a, bit of a flaw. Marketing so, I'm sorry, just to, yeah. Like, I, I realize it shouldn't be about this stuff, but the marketing's so average. Like, you're looking at the, the web page and it's this brown bike. I'm like, guys, really? I mean, it looks like a. I had no. I don't even want to say that. I hate doing that, but it looks like a Chinese carbon. Mm. It looks like a polygon, mm. or a. It just. Ah, jeez, God, get that. So another bike, also came out. What? What's with October? Mm. Well, end of September seems to be the month. Hot month. But uh, the new Bianchi special this month, which means same basket as the Ridley uh, Falcon, um, but to me is more interesting. So lightweight plus aero, but at least looks unique. I mean, wait, what's the type of thing here with this category now? Because there's so many bikes in this category and the performance differences are either hard to quantify or if they are quantified, are probably pretty marginal anyway. So really what you've got left is what looks cooler. And the new Specialisma looks sick. Compare that to... They're, I mean, the different price points, but compare that to the Ridley. I mean, this looks uh, pretty, pretty neat to me. I'm, uh, I rode a Specialisma, as you remember. Um, so it, it pains me to say this, but I, I actually agree because, okay, for me, the Specialisma should have always been or should always be that real traditional looking straight ch- tubes, all the rest of it, but road white geometry or and yeah all that kind of chat however this is very much a streamlined version of the full out aero what was it called the ultra rc mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. which i think we might talk about a bit later on but this is this is probably a more approachable version of that and yeah you're right there is a point of difference here there is like oh what yeah definitely there's a bit of a speed sniffer going on here if we zoom in there is some sniffing action on the front end. Oh, it's just a quick bike. It's going to be a quick bike. But you can't see it around. You know, I just, just sorry, can't, see, can't it. see it. Right? But if you could, I mean, you can't, but if you could, your probably thinking this is going to be pretty quick because it does have that kind of beefy bottom of the head tube into the down tube area. Um, I think the curve angle sort of thing on the... Top tube is um, probably going to be love it or hate it. I love it. Um, but hot, absolutely hot. But will we see anyone ride? That, so, that was just how we on the same. I'm literally yeah. about to say that. So the tra- this could just be a concept bike for all we know, because sort of just like the Ultra. The traditional Bianchi specialism rider, and I know a few, mm-hmm. will have seen this press release and have thrown up a little bit in their mouth. Like, there is no two ways about it. The, the person who buys that Bianchi Specialist, like, has no interest in this, is probably the first person in any comments hashtagging the save the rubric, all right? So to try and move that next, I don't know, are they trying to move the next generation of Bianchi people over to this? Uh, maybe. I, I just, from a knowing your market perspective, it's probably, it was probably... If you flip the two brands, Ridley and and Bianchi, they should have actually done what the other guy did. Right. Now, Ridley should have gone a little bit more left of centre and gone this route to try and create a bit of storm. And Bianchi should have just doubled down on, hey, we're Bianchi. Our bikes look the Celeste. Mm-hmm. Who cares? <laughs> you know? So, I don't know. Are you, are you right? Like, will anyone actually get this or will anyone be able to get this is a whole other question. Have you seen the Ultra the Aero bike on the road? Negative. Well, I haven't seen it either. And we're in a good socioeconomic area. We're in the middle of Sydney. People are going to be able to afford a Bianchi. They can here. And I haven't seen one. Um, so I don't know. Are we going to see a specialism? Well, okay. That brings us on to... Do you get any other new... No. No, that's where we've Yeah. Okay. We've been very... Whatever. Let's keep going. Um, speaking of not seeing anything on the road, I kind of... I wouldn't mind actually having this chat. How do we frame this? Is it uh, is it flops of twenty twenty three in in Jesse and Chris's 
space okay, right, potentially. Uh-huh. I don't know, because I do think you brought up a really good point with that Bianchi Ultra. When it first came out, I reckon the two of us sat there and went, Oh, this is this is hot. Like this is we're gonna see a few of these. Like, can't wait to see a few of these. We got that one one video, I reckon, from Grant. It was like borrow the bike from some random guy in Miami. And honestly, that is the only thing of content I've seen on it, let alone in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a bit of a flop mm. for me. Well, you've also done no research on this. It may be just an Australian thing. Maybe they're all over the place in Italy. I don't know. I disagree. We've done all the research that we should have done, which is ride our bikes a lot and like I- had a look around. We, we, we troll the forums. We troll through YouTube. That is all the research I mean should that should be done yep. into these sort of things. I still think it's probably a really good bike. That's why I'm annoyed it's kind of in the flop category because it could actually be an S5 but lighter and ride a bit better. It's possible. It's possible. I totally made that up, but it could be. But we just has anyone even reviewed it? That's the other thing. It's not even in the YouTube lane. It's on sort of first look basis. Anyway, moving on. So th- I guess, yeah, that's a flop, but... I reckon that goes for all these. The we need all these bikes we want to talk about. Really? But anyway. So I have a flop bike. It really pains me to say, but the giant TCR through... Interesting. Explain. Well, through how well-perceived their other bikes are, particularly being the Propel, mm-hmm. it's a hard sell the TCR now. Because if you're walking into a shop and you can get the Propel now for not that much heavier within a kilo weight-wise, and then the person on the shop floor can just say, well, it's way more aero. Well, where's, what's the selling point of the TCR now? No, I'm saying selling point. Not, I'm, so I know we'll have one and say it rides really well. But I'm talking just selling them, seeing them on the road. It's the propels kind of out and then bring in the new Defy, give that six months on the shop floor. Well, who's buying the TCR? I hear what you're saying. I don't disagree. I almost feel like I, I want to give a bit of a free pass to the brands that are doing the lots of different models because you're dead right. Like out of those three models that you just mentioned, there's a lot of crossover. And so at the moment, the ugly duckling is the TCR. But like... I don't want to diss the this it and then giant go. You know what, Chris and Jesse were spot on. We get a ditch. <laughs> we get a ditch the TCR. Like I don't want that. I want them to up that TCR. But you are dead right, and I, I do feel like with a lot of those brands where you do have, and we talked about this the other week, where you have the multiple models. Okay, so Cervelo, obviously the, the other obvious comp here. Mm-hmm. You know, the R five is probably. You know, who's really buying the R5 now when you've got the other models in there? And it's probably the ugly duckling in that family. I don't know. That, so to me, this was a giant specific thing because even with Cervelo, there's such a big difference between an S5 and an R5. Mm-hmm. There's, you, no one's kind of, oh, I'm not sure. You know. You know when you're going in. Whereas Propel versus TCR. Ah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, Potentially, yeah, they are, they're all up closer. Mm. So in the Cervelo range, um, the Soloist is probably the one that's competing with the R5. Mm. Um, yeah, I see what yeah. you're saying. You're probably right. In that in that comp, you're probably right that the S5 is the full-out aero. Yeah, mm. okay. No. But that's a similar. So the equivalent would be if you walk into a shop, why would you really buy an upper buy at R5 all over the Soloist? Because mm. again, I mean, I haven't, I'm not as uh, in the details on the Cervelo lineup, but let's say the Soloist was within a kilo of the R5, which is probably not, but let's say it was. Hard sell getting the R5 these days. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, okay. I'll, I'll give you that. Can I, can I throw another one in? Yeah. The Canyon Ultimate. The Canyon now, Ultimate. Okay. So it's yeah. the, the light wake of my mind. Okay. And okay. Again, never in it. Don't know. <laughs> research has been done. And my research is this. Yep. Like that felt to me like there was this lot, there was lots of hype leading up to this being launched. When is when is Canyon gonna up gonna upgrade the ultimate? When's it gonna do? Because it's been such a big bike, blah, 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 blah. 
like, and then it gets launched and it, you see all the videos and I've seen a couple of them out and ultimately you've just sort of gone, oh, no cup. So it's slightly lighter. But I, I certainly, okay, put it this way. If Canyon upgraded the air road, re, that would be huge. Mm -hmm. I do think it would be huge. I just don't feel like this is cut through the same. Totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, and more and more just because I'm sure people are buying it, but I can just remember like, oh, new Ultimate's coming out. Like, And I even texted you when we, it got launched and it was like, wow, have you seen it? Like, it's just got launched. It, it's, it was an it. I didn't even have to refer to like the brand or the, the model. Like we knew that's what, was, what we're going to be talking about. So I don't know. I just feel like this has passed us by now. Mm. The problem with, do you think it's because it doesn't do any, it doesn't have any gimmicks? And in this day and age, with the, everyone wanting the aero, if you release a lightweight bike, well, I feel like it has to be gimmicky now to get some movement. Like the Ostro, not the Ostro, the uh, O2 van that got released. And they've gone, they've, they've copied GC, uh, Giant, they've done the, the integrated seat post. And you're like, yes, it's a lightweight bike. And it's got a weight saving integrated seat post. I'm on board. But now, okay, a 6.8 kilo climbing bike with no gimmicks. Nah. But, I mean, what, 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 what would you want out of the ultimate? I disagree. I hate gimmicks. As I mentioned, yes, the Benarello thing. I want less gimmicks. Uh, yeah, I, I do think a lot of it mainly comes back to the fact that the the person they're trying to get to buy the the lightweight climbing disc bike is probably the person who's still on ring brakes and they're like, hey, look, you can get a disc brake bike and it's light. I promise, see, all that stuff that Duran Ryder said about it being really heavy, it's not true. You can get one at six point whatever kilos. Yeah. Hey, look at us. Mm -hmm. And those people either don't really want to do that or have maybe got on a do it all, aero bike, you're going, yeah, hey, whatever. Mm. It's actually just as fast. So maybe maybe it's more about the market of it. Uh, I just feel sorry for, so for Canyon because what well, I feel sorry for them, but I don't know, is there anything specific, specifically about the ultimate that, that you, why you all think it's a flop bike or are you just going climbing bikes in general flop? Potentially there's some bias, my own bias, and it was definitely my own bias in that. It's a fair point. I haven't seen many, and ones that I have seen, everyone who's kind of ridden it has gone, yeah, it's fine. I don't know, that's <laughs> not, that is a, not, and not to blow smoke up their ass, maybe they're just really good at this, but anyone who's ridden a sniffer, a, an SLA, I'm having to like shove my face in their hand in their face, say, shut up. I don't want to hear about how good your bike is anymore. So I don't know, I'm just, maybe it's just that. But that, I think the same thing would be true going back to the R5. Like if they upgrade that next year, they have to do a lot for me to go, mm. everyone to go, wow. Next flop for me, Canada Super 6 Evo Lab 71 because of the price. In Australia, the Lab 71's $20,000. A Tarmac SL8 with a power meter is also $20,000. And they are they can't compete with an SL8 S Works in terms of perceived performance. So why are they charging the same price? I don't know. And for me, that's straight in the flop category. Yeah, I mean, hard to argue. I mean, all I will say is the, the few people that I do know who rides ride them, love them. But I can also say pretty certain that they didn't pray recommend the retail for <laughs> so in fact i would say i don't know anyone who has paid recommended retail for that bike hmm. that would be a pretty yeah wow the thing that gets me here is it's kind of easy to say well that's for the top end model the mid-range models are better value and they could compete more in that space but i look at that and go do we give brands free passes to just do some ridiculous blowout top end model to make their mid-range bikes seem more premium. I feel that's a cheap marketing tactic, to be honest. 
are they really unless they're coming out here really thinking that their brand has the, the cachet that to be matching S works, or is it for that reason just to to bolster their mid range? And if if it is just to bolster their mid, yeah, so if it is, they feel like they could compete brand wise. Well, all power to them. I dis- wholeheartedly disagree. And if it is just the bolster of the mid range, I think that's kind of cheap. Yeah, just release a good bike and why well, not? I think people can definitely argue with us about whether it's a good bike in terms of it rides well. Definitely, I'm, I'm happy to give push back on that. But you can't argue with that fact. That's a fact. You, you that brand cannot compete with with those others that you mentioned. Trying to, in that same space. I mean, I, it, Cannondale, I think, was one of the first like bizarre rants that I went on on the show months and months ago. Because I had really bad, a bad vibe about Cannondale, about where it was headed. That where was it going to try and be? Was it going to be this? Because this is it going to try and be this uber premium, you know, um, top of the line everything kind of kind of brand? Because that's not what it cuts teeth on. Like it was. Canada was like um, kind of out there a little bit, like the sort of left of centre sort of brand. It was a bit interesting. Is that what, is that what it was to you? When I got into cycling, let's say 10 years ago, I always thought of them as a bit of giant. It was sort of, okay. yeah, the Cannondale, the Super 6, it was a pretty standard frame, nice and light, and just it was your run of the mill, proper middle of the road, just get the job done sort of thing. I never really thought of it as a premium brand. Maybe it might No, it wasn't. So uh, not a premium brand. I'm not saying premium. I'm saying oh, like, yeah, yeah. like, like a bit more interesting. Like, oh, right. okay. Back when sort of IBM was IBM and Apple was this little other brand. It was like the little other mm. brand doing sort of funny things. Oh. That was kind of what oh, I saw it as. And now this new direction on it just seems... Stress. It did have it had that in the off road category when it had that lefty fork thing that came out. Yeah. Oh, it's on crazy. Yeah. Oh, so that was pretty nice. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, that's yeah. I'll, I'll leave that there. I just think it's. I think it's a flop. I just don't understand what what the point of that lap seventy one version is. There was a time I reckon where it was the influencers brand as well. I I think like it had all it had every it was cool because okay you had the Sagans mm-hmm. definitely. But also in that sort of time when YouTube was sort of starting, Instagram was kind of happening. I just, I'm not going to be able to name the names off the top of my head. I mean, obviously you've got Lockie Morton and that stuff, but that's a little bit later on. But I feel like they got out in front of that, and it was, it was the influencer mm-hmm. brand before there was such a thing as an influencer. Would you say it's the equivalent of a factor in this day and age? So, yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I want to throw another brand at you. Okay. Question without notice. All right. Standard. 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 I think they have absolutely nailed the Instagram YouTube influencer brand. I don't know what this bike is. I have no idea about it. Oh, but all of a sudden... If I open up my Instagram Explorer feed, I'm seeing these beautiful, pretty, like perfect colorway bikes with super interesting decals matched up with like these really interesting personalities riding them in the right kits in these incredibly aesthetically pleasing locations. And I'm like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Where have you come from? And I want one. And I don't know. I, I just, I think they have... I don't, as I said in the beginning, I don't know anything about this brand other than they have nailed the algorithm. Yep. Like algorithm school, you've got a big, big 10 out of 10 for data. Yeah. It does. As someone who's not really into fashion, I think they look cool. Definitely. And not even that expensive. I guess they are alloy out there. I also had no next to nothing about them I've, except for I recognize them because they do look pretty sick. Um, so they've just come out of nowhere. Let's let's leave that aside then, because I do want to have maybe a chat about that brand a little bit, uh, maybe next week or the week after, because I there's two people I want to talk to about this brand. Cause I know um, Cash bring these in, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to talk to them about this and maybe get a bit more information. And I can come back and either call it a flop or call it um, call it really good branding. Mm. Well, it breaks. There were breaks. Yes, it's yeah. All right, guys, one of your flops of 2023, let us know down below.
Well, it's Wednesday we're recording. This will come out on Friday. So just keeping track of this transfer news, team merging stuff. It does look like from the Twitterverse is telling us Roglic de Bora is going ahead and with the support of Red Bull, that's how they're going to afford that. And then the uh, super team is pretty much confirmed at this stage going ahead, the Yama Visma Sudal Quickset merger. And then the, so the question is uh, Remco to Ineos or the new super team? Not sure. But then they kind of blew me away, though, with with, with Roglic now coming on as a, as a Red Bull athlete. They could help pay for part of his contract. So it's going to cost €3 million Euro to buy him out of his current contract. And then his salary will be €5.5 million Euro per year for two years. Um, that's up there with your Vingy guards and those top guys. I don't know. Is he worth it? Is he washed out a bit? No, I don't think he's the right. I mean... Personally, no. I think he could pick it if everything went well. I mean, they're buying him for for two years, and the next two years he could he could win two Grand Tours. One of those could be the Tour de France. I, I, I legitimately think that's a big could. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. pretty. Yeah, I and mean, there's no one else in the market who who's going to yeah. potentially tick that box for them. Um, the the Red Bull thing coming in. Interesting. Don't you think? Yeah. yeah. So he got a DM. He got on the he got on the short list of Red Bull athletes. Mm. It's in, don't you reckon? It's Primoz and it's Primoz a Red Bull. Everybody. That's exactly what I was thinking. So he's going to be running the Red Bull helmet. I'm guessing he doesn't have the. Let's let's call a spade a spade, because a Red Bull athlete yeah. is the coolest. Mm. Yeah, is, is the coolest member of whatever sport you're doing. Now, a lot of the, the Red Bull athletes are just doing a cool sport, so it's kind of easy for them, like I don't know, half port, half pipe mm. snowboarding or something like that. But in, and we've discussed this before, in road cycling, he's not the top ten. No, no, no. no. I'll call. I'll. I'll or if we've had to put one, if I put one word on it, it's steeds. The Red Bull athletes have to have steeds. Roglic has zero steeds. He is he's an epic hubbard. He is of greatest proportions. I identify quite well with Primoz. Quite well. I mean he's he's the, the pictures of him back in the day doing the the fondos with his helmet up mm-hmm. and all that kind of sketch matching the red bull helmet oh, yeah. flicked back oh uh, this. No, I mean, come on. Surely Justin Williams is gonna send them a message sort of be the heat of we can't let him into the fold here. What do you think, then? Is that is that that money? I mean, I don't have an issue with it, but in you, you are you surprised by that? I'm just finger guard, Remco, Sepkus, apparently, Tanner Bagatcha. So what's that? Fifth, kind of at best level Grand Tour rider, and he's on. I would put him in front of Remco. Okay, yeah, around. Yep. Okay. Well, in that case, but she's fun. Yeah, but I think this was. Do you remember the chat we had with um, uh, Patrick and Benji, Martin Rouge? Yeah. And they, uh, maybe it was the first chat we had with Patrick, where he, we were talking about the team budgets and stuff like that. And he was breaking it down and talking about how much the rider's salary actually goes towards it, the team budget. It's extraordinary. How much of the whole team budget mm. is is rider salary? When he was talking about the super team stuff, it was like it was sort of eighty percent, eighty five percent just rider salary. Yeah. Like, and so if you, I suppose, move that forward then and look at Primoz's salary, then I'm not that surprised by that. I don't think it's good. I think it does come back to this whole thing of the the sport being a basket case, which we said last week about the whole framework of it. Um, but yeah. Is he going to be... Bora proves himself with, with Jai Hindley and stuff. What does this mean for, for Jai Hindley, then? It's not good news. No, no, no. It's, it's, not, no. it's not good news for Jai Hindley. I, I don't see where this is good news. But there's no there's no reality where Primoz and Jai Hindley are in a race together and it's probably a good thing for Jai. Okay, so here's a question. And this is part of back to my whole set course gate sort of discussion. Jai Hindley's on the team. He's the GC leader. They pay a gazillion dollars for Roglic to come in. Does Jai Hindley get a pay rise because he's now second fiddle and has to probably either be a domestic for Roglic or 
play those sort of tactics where it's a two, it's a co-leader situation. I mean, for for a guy like Jai Hindley, that's less val a less valuable spot on that team now because now you're second in line. Mm-hmm. So does he get a pay bump? Probably not. But I would say that's a, sort of an example. I think he deserves a bit more money now because he's not he's not getting what he probably thought he was going to get when he signed that contract that he was going to be the top top. So that's the sort of stuff where I go, hmm, cunts, fuck for him. Yeah, I definitely think there'll be some sort of re- there'd have to be some sort of renegotiation then. You're right. Mm. Just comparing even the salaries is just a joke. Wasn't there a soccer player? You lost to name him. Um, and he's on like. I ended up I read for years. I'm like, this bloke's a billionaire because he's on like hundreds of millions a year of euros. Who was the player? And uh, to be about that, that, yeah, some, yeah, was that him? Yeah. Contract. Highest ever. A bit. PSG reportedly offer highest ever one point one billion dollar lifetime contract. Um, yeah, you're now a billionaire from from playing soccer. But that doesn't surprise you, does? It? Do you? I mean, he you, you knew that, like. It, I, I knew that while well, I knew they were big, I didn't know they were getting paid hundreds of millions. I mean, how does freaking okay? This is going to go way off. That this is probably like I know Saudi Arabia has a, a lot of oil and they're worth a lot of money, but where is the money to pay a soccer player billions of dollars? Well, over time, okay. And, I get that What's the GDP of this country? What, what the fuck? No, it's not so much that. The, the massive difference is there's actual value in those commodities because of broadcast rights. And you have sus- relatively sustainable income. Now, that's been taken to a complete extreme when the, when it's come to the Saudis. But there's been a, 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 growth, a growth pattern across all those sports, soccer, all like American sports, as all because of broadcast deals. And you have sustainable teams that are franchises that continue year in year out Mm -hmm. we don't have any of that and so the joke is that um from professional cycling's perspective you go back quite a few 20 years the salaries aren't that dramatically different Mm -hmm. to what they are now you haven't seen this massive like if you look at nba in the last 20 years or 30 years the growth has been like you could have a guy on ten million dollars, and it was like, holy shit! Now you're on got you're on with guys on a hundred million dollars, and that's the sort of growth you have not seen that in our sport. I'm not going to get into a basket case of men's professional cycling chat because maybe we can do that at one point with with Lance Armin, but like, yeah, there's there's a million reasons. Mm. I think it's just, I mean, yeah, but the the, the Tour of France. Now, it depends on what website you looked it up. I think some of the stats were dodgy, but they were saying if you could accumulate all the total views, the Tour de France is up there in global sporting events. Mm-hmm. It's like in the top 10-ish kind of in terms of eyeballs. I'm not sure if that's accumulated over three weeks. It probably, I'm guessing it probably would be um, because, you know, it's not competing in cricket. I mean, you got a gazillion people in India watching cricket. So it's going to be hard to compete, but there's a lot of eyeballs on the Tour de France. Then you think it's down the line, and then the top, the top, the top riders are getting like, you know, four or five billion a year, and this Neymar Junior is two hundred forty million a year. Like, what? That's like that you could fund the entire sport on one dude's one dude's salary. You're like, I don't. Know. I got three letters for you. ASO. The ASO just take all that money, and can that's our our sport is actually run by an organisation that doesn't run our sport. That's all the money. Like a team's finance. Remember talking to the uh, Mitchell and Scott when those Mitchell and Scott guys talking about now. Like their sponsors are ninety percent are committed to the, the Tour de France. That's all they want is Tour de France exposure. The rest of the year couldn't give a shit about it. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. any of the income that that's dragging in is going to this bizarre French family-run organization, mm-hmm. and it doesn't get distributed equally and even if it does get distributed equally you look at the fact that we just had two teams you know they've now disappeared so you know there's no ownership from a fan's perspective and we talked about this the other way like no one's growing up with a yumbo bismuth t-shirt you know coddled in one at birth and like you are in in football and basketball and things like that so 
Yeah. Anyway, so we had Dylan on during the week, another another YouTuber. So Jesse, you're you're the the person who's been doing this. So each time we talk to someone, I uh, find out they're pretty good blokes, etc. Mm-hmm. Same goes for Dylan. Mm-hmm. But you tend to cat- characterize them or caricature you up. Huh? Each each of them. Kind of, have you have you had a thought about where where oh, Dylan? Give you. me a, you got to give me some time to come up with something. Uh, okay. Let me have a think. Okay, so what Jesse's thinking about, I'll just quickly backtrack. So, uh, Lancia Barouge was kind of your boss at work, um, your cool boss at work that you can kind of socialize with. Uh, NorCal, Jeff was the kind of cool high school teacher, like probably science teacher who's like class in the afternoon you really looked forward to. It. Vegan cyclist is like your crazy uncle who like turns up at Christmas wearing sort of, you know, crazy socks and hands out crazy Christmas jumpers. Grant is exactly who he is. He's a guy in a bike shop, tree lunch. Just, there's no there's no analogy for Grant. Dylan Johnson is like the school prefect. So I still feel like he's got, got quite a young soul. Still still seems quite young, but he got good marks at school. And he's just the, the whole monitor, school prefect, good achievement, but just, you know, just gets it done. Kind of friendly with everyone, and yeah, these are your prefect. That's that's what I got. Well, school um, school captain. Yeah, all right. My old school captain. Probably should have said school captain. Who I know of. Now I said I think Lantern Rouge school captain. Oh well, yeah, Dylan would have been like sort of a bit lower rung, <laughs> <laughs> like head of day boys. <laughs> that reference <laughs> 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 <It's going anywhere. laughs> The other thing that I saw was um, so Van der Poel, the current road world champion mm-hmm. has come out and said that he's going to be targeting the gold medal in mountain bike in Paris Olympics. So to do this, okay, kind of on the outside, it sounds like, oh, whatever, he just turns up and does a mountain bike race someday. That's not really how it works. Like to be competitive in that, by all accounts, you'd have to really chase grid positions. And that then requires him doing a load of UCI World Cups leading up to it. Long way of me saying that it will impact pretty heavily his 2024 road season, certainly in that middle half, definitely around the two-hour pivot. Um, maybe not his spring campaign as much, but but certainly that, that middle tour campaign. Now, again, look, we've talked about Pidcock and all this kind of stuff in the past. So I don't know whether it's the individual, but I still don't get the value of this stuff. Like putting aside his desire to do this as an individual athlete, I don't understand how his employer thinks this is good. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the course because I'm thinking, why wouldn't he target the road race, the men's road race at the, at the Olympics? I'm guessing the course isn't part of I've got the profile up here. It's certainly lumpy. Uh, maybe the climbs aren't steep enough, so this is probably maybe more of a sprinter's course. I mean, I haven't dug deep into the course, but it's just sort of one to two kilometer climbs at six percent. So maybe he didn't deem that road race hard enough for him. Uh, but I don't know. I, I, what's what? Look, I know what the comments are going to be. You're like these guys are so out of touch, blah blah. All right, but and he, here is my contradiction with this because. I look at, so I've said on this show in the past, like that Tade is potentially one of my favorite riders of all time. And one of the reasons that is, is because he does these different s- disciplines as such. He does grand tours. He races spring classics. Like I love that. Like just blows, like when we go turned up and did the Paris-Roubaix, one of the last years of his career, I was like team we go. I just couldn't believe this guy was doing this. So, you know, there's there's my contradiction here. I do like that. I just don't understand this. And I'm obviously totally out of touch with what Red Bull and all these other sponsors want. They want these guys doing all this multidiscipline stuff. I just so don't get this. I'm I'm just yeah, I'm confused as to why I'm so out of touch with this. Class, same eyes, you know. Especially when, on paper, the road race looks like it's a decent bet for him. You think, okay, back off the road season. And the, oh, we don't even need to back off the road season that much. You might have to structure your racing a bit more. So it's a bit well-timed. But it's way less of a shift than 
It's not even a mountain bike race. I don't know. It's, I don't, yeah. I don't really have another take. I know I don't really like it. It's, uh, yeah. It's just disappointing because, yeah, ultimately it's going to take him potentially out of the, the road race, which, yeah. And like, I would, I agree with you. I would love to know who's pulling the lever here. Is it the Dutch Federation? I highly doubt it because he's a professional individual athlete. But there's someone here saying, I this is what we're we in yeah, Olympic mountain bike. That's it. Maybe it's him. Maybe he just has some inbuilt internal drive to be an Olympic champion and he feels like it's a better shot in the mountain bike than the road race. But I'd love to know who's doing, what's the driver. Oh, I'm sure that's the case. I'm sure he, he's he got this like picture in his mind of like, you know, I'm the world champion on the road and I'm the Olympic champion on the mountain bike. He's... He's got this kind of like grand slam thing, and he said, "I get that. I understand from the individual ego perspective, but just as a and yeah, okay, I'm a road cyclist. I just don't get why the best road cyclist in the world doesn't want to race in the Olympic Games in his discipline. That's ultimately, I think, the question. Yeah. I don't know the answer. You know, lots of people telling me under in the comments that I'm out of touch. I know, and that's why I'm." Talking about this. Yeah. Mush is a friend of ours and he's a friend of yours, ladies and gentlemen, because you all you all have a mush. <laughs> you all have a mush. Mush was uh is Mush is still with us, sort of. Um Mush was a ride with us. Uh, he was a club mate of mine, club mate of yours, and did our first and one of our first couple of NRS races together. Um, but socially, like we would ride pretty much every weekend together maybe a couple of times during the week life moved on um you know things sort of kids all the rest of it sort of develop and you and i spotted over well we haven't ridden with mush in some time you and i spotted over the last week that he put up a strava activity of a game of golf yep walking around the links <laughs> um at which point like both of us kind of went Jesus. We knew it was over, but that was just this. Uh, it was almost just a rub it in for the for the first followers on Strava. Was like I'm really done here. That was quite quite sad. But what what, what are we chatting about here? Well, we had a good problem with him. What's the problem with Bush? I feel responsible. I feel you and I are responsible because something happens. You know, I mean. There's there's push and pull factors to all these things, but everyone's got that one mate who's kind of maybe on the edge or you know he's teetering, he mm-hmm. starts to skip a few weekend rides, pulls he pulling out, pulling out, skips another race, drops out of the group chat for a bit. At that point, should we identify it? Geez, mushes. I think we're losing mushy. I or is this just natural selection? No, I think we need to take a lot of responsibility here because. He's going to have to ride early in the morning, even weekends. It's probably a Saturday 6 a.m. deal, which we're not really into. So who's he left to ride with? Is he on back to the local club to ride? Probably not because he's he's mush. He's got a calf stat and he's quick. He doesn't want to do the club ride. So then he's kind of just, well, I'll just go for a run. Yeah, we kind of, we left him at Owl of the Battlefield yeah. to fend for himself and wear off. Off at 8 a.m. on a Saturday, and he's off at school sport. So I think we are almost solely to blame here. We should have been we should have been better riding friends for him. I know your take on this, <laughs> but some people just don't really enjoy cycling that much. And he has more fun going for a jog. Because if the sport just becomes exercise for you, why would you bother kidding up and lubing your chain and topping up your tubular seal at it's just a bit of a fact. If you're at that stage where you're just trying to stay active three times a week, yeah, you probably are just going for a jog or a swim. It's... And I it's suppose a... once you lose the the mates aspect of it, mm-hmm. because you know we're off faffing around two hours later than him and potentially doing an interval session. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like what's in it for him? I, I, I get that. I just not sure if Mush is the guy that's always like, I've got no time, I can't do anything. Like he still exercises, so it's not he's not. Um, but I think that's 
that's kind of why I brought it up because I, he's, yeah, he's still trying to stay fit. Like riding his bike's just not a faff about to the coffee shop thing for him. Mm. And so, yeah, I think that's why, why seeing the golf Strava activity was so confronting to me because like that's not him. But I, I think, yeah. But he also doesn't really seem to have stayed on the periphery of the cycling from a hobbyist point of view. I don't think Mush is watching cycling YouTube. I think he's just pretty much excommunicated the whole scene. Whereas I find that more sad mm. in that someone who would have considered himself a road cyclist is now can just wash his hands with it and, and move on. And I, I think um, I'm maybe I'm more scared. I'm like, well, could that be me one day? I just go, ah, fuck this. And I just nothing I do is anything to do with road cycling. Well, I don't see it, but um, that's probably the, the bit that gets me. It's just wow, you could just leave it all behind. I wonder if that's actually more common than than us. Do you know what I mean? Like, where the the the, the most common like curve for someone who rides is actually. Gets into it, rides for five, eight years, starts to stop nine years. By ten years, isn't doesn't subscribe to Duran Rider anymore, and by eleven years is watching skiing vlogs. I don't know. Yeah, that, um, yeah I've seen that, but I've also seen a lot of the guys that just stay on the periphery. Maybe they don't even really ride them well, but they're still interested in the sport. And then the hobbyist side, so the professional side, maybe they still watch a little bit of racing, but they're also still into the whatever they consider their hobbyist side to be. They stick stick with it. And they can't, maybe each year they got a come in and come out. I still see a lot of that, which is why I've, I would like to think that most people do that because there's more people in the in the industry. It's just yeah, it's, it's really yeah. Him uploading that golf golf walk on Strava, I was like, wow, he's just really ditched us. He's just. <laughs> cut all ties what do you reckon I, you know kid stunts high school so look looking after themselves watch out men's masters three big comeback oh big comeback. probably buys a time trial bike probably redoes the back shed and gets the full indoor setup what else is he gonna do uh for, for, legally uh i'm not sure yeah i mean he could go could def- he'll be he'll be the gym. Mm-hmm. Guarantee you it'll be in yep, the gym. Yep. Three small oh, three sessions oh, away yeah. in there. Yeah. Dead yep. Yep. squats. Yeah. Yeah. Be ripped. Probably I think an overseas riding trip will kick this off again. Oh, yeah. It'll start to build back, but sort of teed up. There'll be two weeks in Girona, and then it'll come back and boof. It'll hit. Um I waited. I waited. So I've probably got another yeah, I reckon five years. We've got five years to wait, and then we're just gonna see. Yeah. The Mushinator. Yep. Masters 3. Bring you back. Let's yeah, he's my age group too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's uh, he's a national... Yes, no, he's a state state criterion Masters champion. Wow. Oh, don't, don't put the Masters bit. He's Sorry, a state champion. State champion. State champion. It doesn't matter state what champion. it is. State champion. State champion. Yeah. Speaking of guys, quickly talk about Masters. Um, I don't know how to say this, but I find when I go to a Masters event or any Masters thing, other masters riders are incredibly intimidating, but I don't. So, like, if I see them riding around the the city or the town that you're in, I don't know what it is about the look of like a fit masters rider, but they're really scary to like. I'm immediately intimidating. Like, I immediately see them and go, "Oh, that guy's so fast, he's gonna beat me." Gonna be me so hard. why are we even doing this? Uh, so, but I, I know what your answer is going to be. It's going to be oh, because you see them all as like a rival, so therefore that's why you see. It's not that. There's a look to it. There's a look to like a, they're all tan. They're all tan. Yes, super yes. tan. Mm-hmm. And like, yes, I don't know what's going on with the body fat percentages, mm-hmm. but there's not a lot and muscular. Mm-hmm. Whereas like, you know, I, I know what it is. I know what it is. Okay, because it's not today. I'll be fat. It's all shed by that stage. So it's that like tanned, grainy skin and just like I have been doing intervals for the last 30 years. 
and it's yeah, I'm I I I can just picture the ride up. Got it in my head. I I know exactly what you look. And that rider who ro- rides past me might have a threshold of 250 watts, yeah. but I am so fucking intimidated by them. Whereas like it wasn't that long. I was turning up to NRS races as a contestant, being in there, and like no one scared me. But half the f- three quarters of the field had FTPs far higher than mine, mm-hmm. but no, no one intimidated me because they all walked, like you said, like I don't know, like kids, just like oh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Whereas these other guys, I'm like Jesus, and they're all yeah, they're all optimized. Everything's optimized. Even the training rides looks optimized. Yeah. Even Shane Miller has that walk. Even when he's just on a trainer doing the level lap tests and you're just from the side, you're like, there is a weathered master's weapon. And it, that that's the look. Yeah. Except he spends so much time indoors. Get him outside for a couple of weeks, get a bit of sun on the legs. Oh, that's mean looking. He's six weeks away from an issue. <laughs> at, at any moment, <laughs> six weeks away. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, speaking of master's riders, did you see that footage of Lance ripping it up? Uh, I think it was in Mallorca. They had a, a move. I think of this, yeah, uh, seen that one? Yeah. Tell you what, he's, he's still, okay. Yeah. He's on the, yeah. he's on the Kia Ritzia program. <laughs> he's, he's looking me. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a, there's a grainy look and see to him that definitely feels like it's been. Fair enough. Like, he's quite like, probably going on 60 now, isn't he? Getting old. No, he's still, still ripping it up there. Yeah. The move did a cap in Mallorca. Mm-hmm. Do we need a mirror and euro shake? Mm-hmm. I hear you um denied about it. Oh, has a bit boring in two training. Theirs looks like actual fun because they'll get all the latch shit right on and how is it be a bit too serious? It's a no chat. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Earphones or earpods in. All right. There's nothing about that kind of campy thing or even the sort of the charity ride things that happen that going out and drinking and then having a ride. 150k the next day. Oh, I just can't think of anything worse. If you want to go to the piss, don't go and go to the piss and just sleep in the next day. Why combine them? I just still to this day don't know why people enjoy combining those two things. I cannot think of anything worse. A training camp, you do five hour rides, chef's kiss. Getting on the piss on a Saturday, sure, I'm in it. Just together? Do you see? Is do you see it? Or well, what's this is punishment? Well, it's the it's why the vibe of gravel died away, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. No, I just it's uh it's not a match made in him. That'll do us this week. Unfortunately, guys, as you notice towards the back end of today's episode, we lost the audio again. We have discovered what the problem was. Basically, our audio mixer needed a firmware update and was crashing midway through our recording. So unfortunately, we did lose about half this and had to resort to some camera audio. Trust me, guys, this has been a massive frustration, but we are on top of it now. We still hope you did enjoy today's episode, despite that audio, and we look forward to next week, where we'll be back with some crisp audio. Talk to you then.